Hi, this is Pastor Paul Linden Burtwell from Clear Spring Church, and today I want to bring you a word of encouragement. And the title of this word of encouragement is Five Things the Devil Does Not Want You to Know. Today, we're going to be looking at the identity of the believer, and the devil does not want you to know who you are in Jesus Christ. In fact, when I first became a believer in Jesus Christ, as I began to study the scriptures, the one thing that gave me so much encouragement was discovering who I was in Jesus. And as we delve into the scriptures, as we see what God actually says about us, it can give us a whole new identity and a brand new eternal outlook on life. You see, today, so many people get their identity from the world, from what the world thinks, from what the world says. And so many people fall short of the world's standard in regards to looks, in regards to personality, in regards to uh, what Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or Twitter says they should be. And so a lot of people feel down in themselves because they're not achieving these standards that they're seeing online or on television. But we must remember that those identities that are being put out there in social media and on television. These people are airbrushed. They've got the best makeup artists. Uh, they're told what to say. They're scripted. And so we must never look at other people and say, ah, I wish I was more like them. I wish I looked like this person. Because remember, a lot of it is not real. And the world would put upon us pressure, unattainable pressure, for us to live to a standard that's, that's just simply not attainable. But God gives us his own identity in the scriptures. He says, this is who you are to me. This is who I have made you as a believer and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we delve into scripture and as we discover who we are, then encouragement and strength comes and we can walk in this world with our head held high, proud, not of who we are, but of who God has made us to be. So today, let's have a look at those five things that the devil does not want you to know, because the devil wants you and me to remain low and defeated and discouraged and uh, removed from all power of God and the presence of God. No, no, no. God wants us to be moving in his strength. God wants us to be moving in his power. God wants us to know who we are in Jesus Christ and to operate in this knowledge. So if you've got your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. And the very first thing that God wants us to know is that we are chosen by him. So let's read the scripture together now. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The first thing the devil does not want you to know is that you are chosen by God. Some years ago, I used to love singing this song and the song was, I've found Jesus. And although I, I loved the artist and I did love the lyrics of the song at that time, the lyrics aren't exactly true. You see, Jesus was never lost to begin with. I was, we were. And it's not so much that I found Jesus. Maybe the, the song should be reworded, Jesus found me. I was the lost sheep, he was the shepherd. And the most exciting thing about salvation for me is that I didn't save myself. I didn't pursue God. I didn't choose to follow Jesus. No, no, no. God came looking for me. God chose me and God chose you. And he chose us to be a special possession of his. As Peter says here, you're a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation and we are God's special possession. You are special to God because God has chosen you. When I proposed to my wife, I went around the jewelry stores looking for engagement rings. And when I found just the right one, I chose it. And I put the money down on the counter and I took the engagement ring and I proposed to my wife and uh, we got engaged and we got married. But I chose that ring for my bride because it was the perfect ring for her. 
it fit her hand perfectly. It's the right size, just the right amount of diamonds. And it's a special ring because I chose it for her. And God has chosen you. You see, to God, you are his diamond ring. God has chosen you. You are special. You are royal. You are holy. You are his possession. Now, I can remember when I was about 17 years of age, I was doing my A-levels in design and technology. And one day I was just sat at home, I was into my exercise and had lots of exercise equipment around. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be great if I could design this harness that had all of these kind of attachments to it and rubber bands so that when you kind of push your arms out, the, the, you get resistance from these rubber bands, but the rubber bands are attached to this harness. And then I thought one step further, maybe I could do that for my feet as well. And I attached these rubber bands to these harness and put it around my feet. And I was using this uh, most days. And the resistance that it gave you was fantastic for building and toning muscle. And so as I designed this, I presented it to my teacher at school. And he said, Paul, I've never seen anything like this. This is a fantastic idea. And I said, well, thank you very much. He said, well, you're going to do well in your A-levels by, by, by working on this and presenting this. And he was even talking about uh, getting a patent for it as well so we could sell it. But what I didn't know is that my teacher was so impressed with the, the exercise harness that I had created that he entered me in for a competition, a young designer's competition. And lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, he got a letter back saying that I had been chosen for this award ceremony. Well, I was blown away. I was so full of correct pride. I was proud that I'd been chosen, proud in my design. I was so excited and my parents were excited too. And I can remember going along to that award ceremony for the design of my harness and there was, can you remember Johnny Ball? And he used to be a, a young children's television presenter and Johnny Ball was there and he was the one who presented me the award and uh, I got to shake his hand and I got to speak with him and it was so exciting to be chosen for doing something, chosen for winning an award for something that I had created. But the most amazing thing about God is he doesn't choose us based on our works or what we have done or what we have created. No, no, no. He chooses us based on his own mercy, based upon his own love, based upon his own wisdom and knowledge. God has chosen you and he has chosen me for the greatest award ceremony the universe has ever seen. And one day we're going to stand before him and he's going to reward you and me for the life that we have lived in him. So remember this and never forget this. You did not choose God. God chose you and the devil does not want you to know that. Amen. Let's have a look at the second thing that the devil does not want us to know. And that is you have been forgiven and you have been redeemed. For that, let's turn to the scriptures right now in Ephesians 1 verses 7 to 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I love that word lavished on us. God has lavished his grace upon you. The Bible tells me that we have been redeemed bought back through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you ever have any doubt of your worth to God, just look at Jesus Christ upon the cross. Look at the beating he suffered. Look at the humiliation he underwent. Look at the anguish, not just in his physical, but in his mental and soulish torment. Look at him upon the cross when the sky grew black and God separated himself from Jesus. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason that God forsook Jesus was so that you and I, so that we could be redeemed. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God wants you. God was willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate cost to bring you into a relationship with him. That's how excited God is about you. That's how much God loves you. And God has lavished upon you lavished upon you his grace. Isn't that fantastic? Now, there are many people today, many believers, and they go around under this cloud of oppression and they feel a weight of the guilt of their sin. Their conscience is heavy. Their walk with God is hard. 
but we must remember that God is so quick to forgive. He is so willing to save us from our sin and that there are two positions of sin. In one sense, as Jesus said, we have had a bath and when we trusted in the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have repented and turned wholeheartedly to God in faith, then we undergo the bath of the Holy Spirit. We are washed, we are purged, we are cleansed, we are redeemed, and we are saved. The Spirit of the living God comes to live on the inside of us, and we have eternal life from that moment forward. But the second aspect is that we must have our feet washed daily. Because as we walk in this world, we will accrue sin in our life. Unfortunately, we all sin, whether we sin in speech, whether we sin in thought, whether we sin in motivation or even in action, we all sin. And that sin, you shouldn't be frightened that somehow you're going to commit a, a, a sin in your thoughts or a sin in your speech or a sin in your actions. No, no, no. You are chosen by God to be saved. God has saved you. You have had a bath but you just need to have your feet washed daily. You see, the Apostle John says that if anyone says that they are without sin, they're a liar, because we all have committed sin. But the good news is, from an eternal perspective, from that positioning in Christ, we are saved, we are born again, and we have a future hope. We don't have to go through this life moping and being down and being dreary and wondering whether we're saved, wondering whether we'll make it. No, no, no. God has chosen you. God has saved you. By the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been born again and spirit filled. But we do need to get our feet washed daily if we're to have that ongoing uh, personal daily fellowship with the Father. And so we come before him humbly and we say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Lord, cleanse me of my sin. You see, so many believers want to go forward, but they live under a, a weight of false guilt. Their conscience is heavy because they have sinned again. I want to encourage you, listen, just get on your knees and say, God, I'm sorry. Please, number one, forgive me of my sin. And number two, give me the grace and the power and the strength that I need not to sin in that way again. And as we grow and as we mature in this relationship with God, God will help us and God will strengthen us. I mean, can you imagine trying to run a marathon? I mean, I can't imagine it. But can you imagine trying to run a marathon with a big tractor tire attached around your waist behind you? Now, if you're incredibly strong, you may get one or two or three uh, feet ahead and then you won't be able to move because those things are so heavy. And so many believers are trying to walk with God or even run with God, run their race that's set out before them with a huge tractor tire of guilt holding them down. I want to encourage you today that the blood of Jesus Christ can cut and sever that tractor tire of guilt. If you have sinned today, simply confess your sin and ask God for grace not to do it again. And one thing I know about my father if he sent Jesus to the earth to go through all of that suffering and that pain upon the cross, how quickly then will he forgive you of your sin? God loves you. God is for you. And God has redeemed you by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing the devil does not want you to know, and I mean really know in your soul, is that now you are a child of the living God. Let's turn to scripture, John 1 verses 12 to 13. Yet to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. How incredible is that, that you and I, we are children of God. I mean, just imagine being a child of a king or a child of a queen. The privileges that you would have, the responsibilities that you would have. And the Bible says we're not just some child of some king or some queen somewhere. No, no, no. We are children of the king of kings, of the Lord of lords. We are a child of the king of the universe. What a privilege. What an honor. What a position. In Christ, we are above the angels. In Christ, we are above the devil and we're above his unholy legions. In Christ, we are seated in heavenly realms. 
in Christ we have an inheritance. This is so exciting. It's so profound. You see, when we were born into this world, we were born into the kingdom of darkness. We were born into sin. We were born separated from God. But through the love and the mercy and the grace of Almighty God, through the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been adopted into his family. Now, I have a couple of nieces and uh, when they were born, unfortunately, very sadly, they were born into a family that did not look after them. In fact, the relationship between the parents and these beautiful children, it was a damaging and destructive relationship to the point where they were taken away from that home for their own safety and well-being. And my wife's sister took them in. She adopted them and she has poured out her love and her hard work and her care and her acceptance. And she has trained them in the way of the Lord and she has raised them in the church and she has taught them scripture and she has prayed with them and she has loved them. Now, it's not always been easy. It's not always been easy. And it's been difficult at times to undo some of the damage that was done. But they have been adopted now into a good godly family. Now they have a hope. Now they have a future. Now they can know Christ for themselves and have that same hope of salvation that perhaps they never would have had if they had remained in that original family. Well, you and I likewise, God sought us out. God called us into his family. He has now given you a future. He has given you a hope. He has given us an exciting prospect. We have the coming kingdom of God to look forward to. And oh, how I long for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ of this world. Would you say amen with me on that? Do you long for the second coming of Jesus Christ? I do. I long for the rapture. I long to be married to my savior. I long for for his return when we return with him to this earth to establish the kingdom of God on the earth for a thousand years where we will see a Satan locked away and a, a, a great a diminishing of sin and sickness and death in the world where we will have resurrected bodies that will no longer die and grow old and, and physically sick but we will live with Christ and we will reign with Christ for those thousand years and if that's not enough. If that's not great, if that's not an amazing future, we have the new heavens and the new earth to look forward to, where there will be a complete eradication of all sin, of all sickness, of all death, of all disease, where we will live with God eternally in the new heavens and the new earth. If we cannot get excited about anything, we can get excited about that. Listen, if we put our hope in the things of this world, if we put our hope in a bigger house, a nicer holiday, a faster car, nicer suits, nicer clothes, whatever it is. If we put our hope in these things, it's always going to disappoint because I'm sure you are like me. You have had new things. You have had a new mobile phone. You have had a brand new car. You have had a new house. You have had a new suit or clothing or dress or pair of shoes. You've had a pay rise at work. You've had things that when you received them, you were so excited. <gasps> Look at my new phone. Look at my new car, look at my new house. But doesn't the sheen wear off quite quickly? Within a week or two, I'm no longer bragging about my new phone or my new car. I'm looking at my monthly payments and I'm like, wow, this is gonna, <laughs> this is gonna cost me. Okay, so when you first get material things, yeah, there's that, there's that moment of, of buzz, there's that moment of excitement, there's that moment of joy of, of getting a new thing, but then it loses its sheen, it loses its excitement but not so with the things of God. With the things of God, it just gets more and more and more exciting, more and more and more fulfilling. As the day approaches, I'm getting more and more excited. How about you? So please don't put your hope and your joy and your, your happiness in worldly stuff. Worldly stuff will only entertain us. Worldly stuff will only make us uh, happy for a very short period of time, usually no more than one or two days. And then we're having to purchase something else to keep that kind of, to keep that buzz going. No, no, don't live like that. Don't live the rat race. No, no, live for Christ. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Get real joy deep down on the inside of you because you have been chosen. You have been redeemed and you are a child of the living God. And that is where the true excitement rests. That is where the true excitement lies. Let's have a look at the 
fourth thing the devil does not want you to know. And it is this promise. You are a co-heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read the scriptures. Romans 8 verses 16 to 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. We are co-heirs with Christ because we are children of the living God and because we are one with Jesus. Just meditate upon that thought for a moment. You are a co-heir with Jesus. And what do heirs receive? They receive an inheritance. An heir has something to look forward to. Imagine being an only child of a king or a queen or somebody very prominent, a billionaire, and you're the only child. And then that person passes away and you inherit everything that they've got. Every ounce of their money, every material possession, you inherit the lot. Well, the Bible tells me that we're going to inherit what Christ is going to receive. And that's far more valuable than all the money in the world and all the diamonds and gold and jewelry in the world and all the material possessions in the world. We are co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil does not want you to know that. What are we going to inherit with the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, like Jesus, we're going to have a glorified, resurrected body. Now, like me, you're probably getting older day by day and you're getting a few aches and pains and sicknesses. Well, the glorious news is our resurrected bodies will not feel those aches and those pains. They will not get grey and wrinkly. They will not have sicknesses and diseases. No, no, no. We're going to have resurrected immortal bodies just like Christ has now. Now, I'm not saying that our resurrected bodies will be exactly the same as Jesus Christ's. Maybe Christ's body is different to ours. Maybe it's of a higher order. After all, he is God and so he deserves the very best. But we are promised resurrected bodies like Jesus Christ's, and we will live in this glorified state with him, reflecting his glory to the whole world. We're going to inherit his presence, the divine presence of God. The Holy Bible teaches that no one has ever seen God the Father at any time, for he lives in unapproachable light. And when God chooses to reveal himself, he does so through his memra. He does so through his word, his logos. He does so through Jesus Christ. But what we're promised in the book of Revelation is that God the Father himself will come and make his home with you and me. And Jesus's prayer will be answered when he prayed, Father, they may they be one with us as we are one. And in that day, we will get to see God the Father. How exciting is that? We will get to live with God the Father in the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to inherit these great and mighty blessings from Almighty God. So remind yourself of that, because as the writer here says, you're going to go through sufferings just like Christ went through sufferings. You see, I do not believe in the materialistic prosperity gospel where you're promised a life free from suffering, free from sickness, free from material want. No, no, no. The Bible does not teach that. But I do believe in a spiritual prosperity message. I believe God wants you to prosper in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, in your heart. I believe God wants you to prosper in him in this way, that you grow up and mature to become like Christ. But to do so, of course, we have to go through times of testing and times of suffering to purge from our characters and natures all of those things that the old man likes to cling a hold of. So as we suffer, let's remind ourselves of the coming, surpassing glories that await us as co-inheritors with the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't this good news? The fifth thing the devil does not want you to know is that you are now, right now, a brand new creation. Let's have a look at the scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. 
the new is here. Every now and then my wife likes to go off with her friends or with my sister and get a, a makeover done. And she will go away to some spa somewhere and sit in the jacuzzi for a while, get her nails done, have a, have a pampering session. I'm not quite sure what they do at these things, but I think they have like massages on their neck and on their faces and on their back and they have special creams put on. And she comes back feeling all kind of rejuvenated and all excited because uh, she's undergone uh, this, this uh, therapy and she's undergone this, this um, uh, makeover session. Well, the amazing news is, yes, we are looking forward to a future resurrected body. That hasn't happened yet, but that will occur at the rapture of the church. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the rest of us, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, will be transformed, and we'll meet Christ in the air. But what we're being taught here by the Apostle Paul is that if we are in Christ, the new creation has already come. Meditate upon that for a moment. If you are in Christ as a believer, the new creation has already come. You see our dead human spirit, that dead spirit that we were born with, that was dead to God. The moment we trusted in the death, the burial, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. The moment we placed our faith in his atoning sacrifice. The spirit of the living God came into us. God breathed his life into you and our spirit, which was once dead, became born again. It has already begun. Yes, we look forward to the future resurrection of our physical bodies, of course, but the resurrection in a very real sense for you and me has already begun. Our dead spirit that was once alive in Adam has now been resurrected. You have a new nature. You are a new man. You are a child of the living God. You have the spirit of the living God living in you, energizing and giving life and breathing life to your human spirit. We are also under the process of sanctification where the Holy Spirit is transforming and renewing our minds every single day. And we are spiritually saved. In our soul or mind, we are being saved and our physical bodies will be saved at the resurrection. So the new creation has already come and it's so exciting. And so in closing, remember, these are five things the devil does not want you to know, but I want to remind you of. You are chosen by God. You are forgiven and you are redeemed. You are a child of the living God. You are a co-heir with Christ. And now, right now, you are a new creation. So may you walk tall. May you give glory to God and may your life honor and praise the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has made these five things possible for you and me. Until next time, may God bless you richly. God bless.